White Russians was a term used to designate all the Russians who were opposed to the Bolshevik Revolution, spearheaded by Lenin. The Bolshevik had adopted the color as red, and so by opposition to the red, white. They also, the imperial Russian flag was white and with a double-headed eagle. That was uh, the Tsar's flag. My father was an officer in a Russian white army during the Tsar of Nicholas II. Revolution came to Russia. He was fighting, but they lost. So he and a part of his army went to the east of Russia and then into the China. Shanghai at the time was labeled as a symbol of Western capitalist decadence. And culturally speaking, Mao Zedong was quite keen to sort of eradicate this inheritance from the past. In that course, at the eve of the entry of the Mao Zedong Great Army into Shanghai, these people were not going to be able to live peacefully under this regime. We heard how terrible it was for the white Russians. They were taking them to Soviet Russia, and some of them, like in the case of one of my uncles, he was shot. So when we heard that the communists are coming, straight away, we got to go, leave everything. And that's, that's it, whether you like it or not, you know where you're going. And Mr. Bologov was in charge of the Russian Emigrant Association. Bologov, I understand, was a very flamboyant ex-Tsarist officer. And he quickly took upon himself to organize the people. None of us knew where would we end up and what our life would be. Like it was all uncertain. And this is when all these people who were there were regrouped, so to speak, and they, okay, where do we go next? These people had no consular representation. They had no one to turn to. And as we've seen, various communities among them, not only Russians, so it was not a monolithic bloc. They were all Russian speaking, they were culturally Russian, but my goodness, we had Ukrainians, we had Estonians, we had Jews, we had gypsies. Tartar from Crimea, Latvians. There were also some of Armenians and Georgians. Czech, Poles. Hungarians. We even had one family of Hindus. Nonetheless, the IRO was approached by the leader of the so-called White Russians, Colonel Borogov, saying, save us. So the IRO launched an appeal, and the countries were busy with their own reconstruction. None of them replied to the call of IRO. Well, in this very, very remote corner of Asia, the only country who replied to the call of IRO was the Philippines. Barely independent, but also reconstructing the country, which has suffered terrible devastation. Nonetheless, President Quirino put an act on the table and said, we Philippines will accept these people. appreciate the political significance of such an act by the Philippines and the leadership of President Quirino, who grant asylum to a group of people in need of international protection. That is remarkable.
the 26th of February in 49, and I don't know how many days it took on board the ship, probably about six days or so. Tatay kwan manggudan newspaper, makanikunot mga Rusya na to babaw. Pagagusin mga Oscar Simana, kinikita manggudamon ang barko na kada didamo yung manikani. Nga, karga na ang tunga mga Rusya na. Ako ta taera, ti ka ng barko nga dabit sa kamparang, ang bards ni Jose Ulanda. We loaded us up on a PAL flight, and luckily enough, I got a seat by the window. Oh my lord, they had the blue ocean, they had the little islands, they had the palm trees sticking up, I mean, it was great. And the scenery, to see those islands, some waters look purple, some waters look pink because the sun was coming up, and reflection, and it was such a gorgeous, extremely gorgeous sight. In a very pragmatic Filipino spirit, the decision makers at the time said, oh, see, we've got the old hospital structure on the island of Tubabao, which was built by the Americans for the landing operations. Well, instead of having the structure go to waste, we might as well recycle it into a refugee camp. But unfortunately, when the white Russians arrived in Giwan, and particularly in Tubabao Island, nothing was left except for some pavements. Noon, magami ng damo, diri, mga po yung postura. It's more difficult, you know, because of the living conditions of living in the, in the tent. And they, they gave us all those army cots, you know, to sleep on. Quite a shock after living so many years in the cities, you know, you have to come and live in tents, you know, in the middle of nowhere. It was a shock because we didn't know what to expect, especially these people that arrived two weeks before. In two weeks, you see somebody in shorts and some of them even no shoes at all. I was like, oh, what's happening? But, you know, they didn't wait passively to say, we're waiting for a refugee camp for us. So they built it themselves. Clearing up the bushes, the jungles, leveling the ground, uh, and so on, with supports from Filipino communities around them, support from the Philippine government. When we got to the tent, the grass was up to your knees, so you had to pull out all this so that you could put the cot into the place and put your belongings in. My father and I went into the jungle and cut some um, reeds, and we built a fence around our tent. Privacy. When you need to do things, you it find is. a way. No big deal, no. There are a lot worse things in this world, you know. Soon we got used to it. We were happy that we were safe. When you think about it, they lived in Russia and then they moved to China and they had already lived there for 25 years or more. And then they had to be uprooted again. And here they were living on an island where they didn't know, is this going to be the rest of our life or what's going to be the next step? I think irrespective of that, they were happy, positive, looking forward people. As my father always said, as long as you have life, that's what I learned. You had to get accustomed to a different kind of life. And for the elderly people, it was difficult. For us youngsters, we took it as a holiday. All of a sudden, we could see all our friends living together. At that age, you know, everything is wonderful. I love the scenery, I love the sunsets, 
every day it was different and very glorious and beautiful. Our tents were right in the jungle and you could smell the beautiful flowers at night. So strong. It was just exquisite. I would say it was very well organized because everybody had a job over there. Most of the stuff was taken care of by our own people. Engineers who rigged up a couple of uh, motors and provided lighting for the entire camp. My father became a policeman and all the teenagers like my age 15, we had assignment to take care of small children. My uncle, he was advanced uh, engineering group that came to Tubabao in January and they built a dam for our water supply. My dad was assigned to go on the water truck. There were about three or four guys. They would go wherever it was that they got the water, and then they'd bring it back and they'd deliver it to the kitchens, you know, that kind of thing. So we couldn't really waste a lot of water. Almost all the ladies who were capable worked in the kitchen, which was up on the hill, so you would see these ladies going up. So they had actual shifts when they had to work. But every 10 days or every two weeks, the group had to go out there and prepare meals for the district, you know? We had about 14 districts, Ellen, the third. We set up our own little city of 4,000 people. We, we had a hospital with nurses and doctors. The church was constructed out near the oval, far out from camp, which was the main sabor or cathedral. There were other churches there as well. One was in a tent, I recall, was a Baptist. There were several denominations, but the main one was the Russian Orthodox. They would go to church every Sunday. Some people would go to church every day. The people were very religious, yes. And then they opened up a school there. So all the children went there and all the best teachers, you know, taught us. There was an Iro school and there was a Russian school. There was an orphanage that came with the Russians. Bishop John is coming. So they start ringing the bell. That's a tradition. You now when the bishop comes in, you know, the bells ring. Oh, St. John, no matter when you come to the cathedral in Shanghai, he was always there. St. John of Shanghai would uh, gather people off the streets, no matter what background they had, they took him in. He managed to take care of all these kids, boys and girls. I was one of the younger group that was uh, in the orphanage. We had a big tent, half of it was boys, half of it girls. President Elpidio Quirino came to the camp and uh, you know, the band met him with the nice music. It was President Quirino and according to them, his daughter. I remember that we had an artist over there that made a, like a thank you memorial with all the signatures of different group people as a thank you for him. In the camp, they had curfew. They were not free to go in and out of that camp all the time. And the president decided to take down the fences, you know. And that was a meaning that you're not in the camp. The act that President Kirin opposed through an agreement with the International Refugee Organization said, look, we can accept them. In exchange, IRO, please help us to find the durable solution to the plight of these refugees, which was done through advocacy and the work done by IRO with Canada, Australia, United States, France, Belgium, Germany, Argentina, Paraguay, Santo Domingo, a few other countries. Now, the first difficulty was the fact that the major resettlement instrument which existed within the arsenal of law in the United States, the Displaced Person Act, was outdated, for instance, prohibited persons who came from countries who were deemed as unfriendly to the United States to be resettled. So white Russians were technically from a nationality point of view were coming from Russia. So therefore, at the beginning, they were not eligible for resettlement. They didn't want to accept us because we were not under the GP bill. They tried many other countries. Nobody wants a bunch of 6,000 Russians.
St. John, he actually left the Babao, went to America, and he prayed on the steps of Congress. And literally sat on the steps till they would hear him. Until somebody noticed him from the American Congress and said, what are you doing here? And that's when he appealed to the American Congress to allow the white Russians to migrate to America. Senator Nolan arrived at the camp in November of 1949 and he gave promises that people can actually enter the United States of America through the Displaced Persons Bill. Generally, they were very happy that Senator Nolan was there and that he was actually looking into taking them in. So it was somehow a vision of hope for them. Quite a few artists there and they used to regularly go and paint. My uncle painted over 200 paintings. Because my father was a doctor, he was allowed to visit the white Russian camp in Tubabao. And through his work with the white Russians, he invited some people that he knew in the camp over to our house. They used to come to the house once or twice a month on a weekend. A lot of the people in the camp had some kind of ability to do some crafts. I remember that some women used to sell flowers to some people in Giwa. As one of the ways of the earning some money, they did this. Pag nagkakasalubong kami, galing ako sa eskwilahan, sasabihin sa akin, Davi Regen, sasabihin ko yan, Give me bread, I will give you flower. Yes, 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 sabi nila. Katima, kumukuha ako na ang bulaklak na ang tawag dito, laglag. Yan ang binibigay ko. Binibigyan ako ng malalaking American breed. Pag uh, ano ko, uuwi ko, mayroon dara akong American breed. I was a member of the parish choir. Mr. Donayu, who was the finance officer of the Aero, he got interested. So we were invited to have our rehearsals in Tubabao, where the white Russians were staying. Mr. Stenberg, a white Russian, was our organ player. He was a great pianist. There were about 50 people who were musicians. I know that there was one piano teacher who had students in Guiyuan. Nasa katlong baitang ako ng bumabang paaralan nang mag-aral ako ng piano sa kay Professor Walter, isang Russian refugee. Bawat leksyon, isang oras, limang piso ang bayad sa kanya. And everybody put in this, this salary into a special fund. And uh, in our district, they all agree to use it to make the food a little more. Kasi hindi naman mga sanay kumain ng ista siguro yung mga rauso. Kaya may rasyon sila every other day ng baka ng mga negosyante dito. Isa na yung ama ko na naghahatid sa tubabaw ng baka. Dahil sa siya ang nagrarasyon ng baka sa mga Russian refugee, nakilala niya si Professor Walter na marunong magtugtog. Kaya pinapag-aral kami. Madame Karamsin was the third piano teacher that I had in Giwan who taught me a lot. She was the one who uh, taught me more about piano than anybody else. I learned from them that they were from past nobility and so on and so forth. Her husband was a great artist, 
He did uh, painting and metal crafting. They always came whenever we had parties in the house, we had picnics. In fact, uh, they were almost part of the family for us. And when I had my 12th birthday, she decided to give me as a gift, wrapped up in a little handkerchief because she couldn't afford anything else to wrap it up in, was a ring, pearl ring that she had owned since she was a young lady from Russia, in which I kept for many years. And this was the type of relationship that we had with these white uh, Russians. During our graduation, Mr. Stenberg also accompanied our graduation song. We also invited some female white Russians who had choral rendition to the great applause of the audience. All the performances and enjoyed that and the lectures, we kept our culture around all everything Russian. We had ballets, we had orchestras. There was a musical group uh, that had operettas because there was a group of actors. I enjoyed the stage very much, so I was always on stage, either dancing or acting or something. We had movies twice a week. Almost every week we had our own dance band and dances and all that. We could go and swim in the ocean every day and they actually set up some facilities out there where you could swim. It was like a wooden raft. You could just sit out there in the middle and uh, jump in the water. Fresh bread was delivered. Nice bread from Guan. And then uh, people would line up with the army mess kits. And if we didn't eat it, it would spoil, so we would trade it. One time I got two loaves of bread and I went down to the village and I talked to some guy, he had a canoe, and I said, hey, can I use it for a while, you know, I'll give you bread. That's when I discovered fishing in the sea. Oh, that was great. This was how the life went on. You have within the community all the acts which characterize a human society. There were some poets, there were some intellectuals, there were some manual laborers. There were all kind of walk of life. Some of them were falling sick, some were falling in love. A very big typhoon. Of course, everybody was scared because most of the people have never been in a typhoon. It was a very destructive typhoon. You know, the Russians were only living in the Unsitats in some tents. I remember holding down the tents. Shaking the tent and, and it was oh, very noisy and everything. I remember watching the men digging a hole so we could hide. And St. John prayed and prayed and prayed. Bishop will go around and uh, he will cross all the sides. Apparently his prayers were successful in turning the typhoon. Well, we have two typhoons. There's this bad uh, typhoon that they had. The name of the typhoon was Typhoon Ami. After the orphanage left, Tsubaba was destroyed by the typhoon. Everything is broken, even the pipes, water pipes. That bad typhoon. It was apparently a terrible typhoon at the end of the camping and absolutely destroyed the whole camp completely. It destroyed.
destroyed the bridge constructed by the Americans, connecting Giwan and Tubabaw Island and also their tents. Some of them got sick after the typhoon and they said uh, it was really a difficult life. But they had no choice. They had to be there and they had to survive. They had to be relocated. So at first they were sent to Tacloban City, but they were sent back to Giwa. So they had to rebuild again. And that's how resilient they are. The best part about that were the memories of togetherness. It was a very important feeling to be having this togetherness that we are a unit, you know, and we've got to fight it and enjoy the life meanwhile. Some of them migrated to South America, including Argentina, Paraguay. Santo Domingo, but also Germany, Belgium. France had the particularity towards the end to say all the woman-headed household with patients who were suffering from tuberculosis would be accepted by France. And the able-bodied men went to Sydney. And then by 1950, the amendments to the bill was finally passed. So by 1951, Nolan's promise finally materialized and finally the people were able to live their new life in the United States of America. And indeed on the ship that we came on here, the Marine Jumper, we disembarked in Sydney whilst others continued on to Uruguay and so on, South America. We're glad we we're leaving and finally going someplace where we're going to settle down. But on the other hand, we didn't know when are we going to meet again, you know. Of course, I missed a lot of friends. Even if they were young at that time, they understood what it meant for someone like President Kino to save their lives. So they tell it to their children and their children's children. And even to this day, they're very, very grateful. He was a savior for them, a hero for them. The whole Russian community and to Baba owes tremendous thanks to President Karina. Well, I'd like to thank him for letting us spend time in the Philippines. Thank you for them to give us a place to stay. I'm grateful for the experience, I'm grateful to the Philippine people, and there's lots of good things and lots of bad things, but we persevered. It was better than any pirate movie I've ever seen before, you know. When you're young, you don't think of the rest of your life. You just live everything. It's beautiful, such a good life. But as you grow older and you begin to reminisce about your life, and that teen, that really did come up with it, it changed everybody's life. That's my feeling toward the Philippines, forever grateful, forever grateful.